I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. Last time we were introduced to Lance Earl. Thanks for coming again, Lance. Lance, you. if you'll just in quick summary, uh, was active growing up and uh, I guess had a little bit of time to himself and then found Jesus or found uh, the church again and you were very mm -hmm. active and sealed in the temple and was a gospel doctrine teacher, an elders quorum president, a high priest group leader and uh, had some unusual and interesting experiences. And so we're, one thing that you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier and it was a one of the uh, can can I correct something just because I absolutely. don't I don't want to lie. No, no, yes. Even if it's unintentional. I I have served in several high priest group quorums. Leadership. I was never the high, I I was a okay. counselor, oh, okay. secretary, that sort of thing. Okay. So I was I was the elders quorum president. I was never the high priest group leader. Oh. So I apologize okay. for that. Little... No, sorry about that. <laughs> Bib. Anyway, no, uh, but, but you mentioned uh, and and Lance has written a number of blogs and and po podcast or po uh, posts on it's called www.theword.one and you can hear more of his story and some of these things that he's written. And we're going to touch on a few of those because he's had some insights. And he also has a young lady who writes with you. Are there more than one? Is there more than one that writes? Uh, right, right now it's Millie. There are yes. others who I think we're trying to bring in. Millie, uh, Millie Salgado. Yeah, Salgado. And a uh, delightful young lady who I interviewed a few months ago or a year or so ago now, but she's really a sweetheart. Anyway, she's written some of those as well. But anyway, one of the things that you'd written was, and we kind of hinted at it earlier last time, was this little Jesus to the big Jesus. So tell us just a little bit more about how that uh, concept came about for you to write that article. Uh, okay. Um, In just the, yeah, just the, yeah. the gist of... The gist what's, your, of it. what's your meaning by that? Sure. Um, I, I used to fly in the Air Force. I was a flight engineer oh. on, on transports. And so I've got worldwide flight experience. And one of the things that we used to fly into Yokota Air Force Base in Japan. Wow. And just outside the gate was a little fruit stand. A little Japanese man would sell me a bag of nashi. And those are those Asian pears that you can buy at Safeway. Here. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And they are, if there's a celestial fruit... That was it. <laughs> that, that was it. And so I, I did a podcast about that. And I would always buy a big bag of those with the intention of bringing them home to my wife and kids. But they were so good, and our trips were like 10 days long. I ate them every time. I never brought any <laughs> home. <laughs> to my shame. Um, but I, I wrote a podcast about that because then those Asian pears showed up in Safeway and Albertsons and... Oh, so you get them locally then. Yeah. yeah, but these are Asian pears that were picked green, ripened in a warehouse in hell somewhere. Oh. Because they are nasty. No, nothing like the ones outside the No, the and airport. so when I talk about the big Jesus and the little Jesus, it's the, the little Jesus is the Jesus I knew when I didn't know any better. And so people that have never been to Yakota and bought these from this little man, they buy the Albertson version and they think they they're good. Think, well, they're oh, oh, they think, think that's good. what's good. Yeah. yeah, they think that's good. But to me, 
the Albertson is it's just a cardboard facsimile of the real fruit. Yeah. The Jesus I followed was a cardboard facsimile of the Jesus I now know and love. Yeah. And so anyway, when I talk about big Jesus, little Jesus, um, I, it started early on in the Mormon religion when Joseph Smith, a month before he died, he said, uh, I have more reason to boast than ever any other man had. And then he listed a bunch of men. He listed Paul and Peter and John and, I don't know, several of the apostles. And, and they're important men, but they were just men. Yeah. And then on the last of that list, he added Jesus. <laughs> Jesus came last, and then he said, but I have done more than any of these. And the church never left, uh, the people never left me yet, but they left Jesus or something right. like that. Right, you know? yeah, yeah. That's in the history of the church, too, by the way. Yes, That's not it just is. A, don't, don't, something we made up. But. Don't take my word. And in fact, if you go to the word dot one and go to our quotes section, we've got an interesting section on quotes. You can go to quotes, click on Joseph Smith. It's right there. We'll tell you exactly where to find it in church documentation. Okay. So it's right there. So anyway... When, when a man stands up and says, I have powers that rightfully belong to God, then the man makes himself large and makes Jesus small. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. And so the Bible tells me I can go and be forgiven. I can go to Jesus and get forgiveness. Yeah. But the church says, no, for some sins you got to go to the bishop. Well, that's just... To me, that's backwards. The bigger the sin, the more I need Jesus. But in the church, the bigger the sin, the more the more you have to go to the bishop. The bishop that's so, right. so it is the smallest of men who are forgiving the largest of sins, oh. and that makes Jesus nothing. Yeah, very minimize him. Yeah. And when you said that you were sitting on the bed that day, and the big Jesus came to you, but you uh, you didn't recognize him as that. You assumed that he was the Mormon Jesus. Uh, uh, the little Jesus. That, yeah, you know, yeah. If I've said that correctly. <laughs> yeah, that was that was after a few years where I had dove into sin pretty deep. And, yeah. And and finally had that. Well, let's call it what it is. It was a come to Jesus moment. Yeah. And Jesus came to me, and I said, "Gosh, thanks. That's awesome. I'll cry a tear." And we'll, and then I pushed him aside. Yeah. And took my sins to the bishop for forgiveness when I had Jesus right there in that room with me. Yeah. Crazy. Then the bishop became big, Jesus became small. Now you said you've always had this or enjoyed a good relationship with Jesus um, and always. So when you went to the temple, and this is one that struck me, did you know, what did you think of Jesus' role in the temple? Did you muddle on that at all? You I don't know? want to fill in words for you, but I, had a, I have a concept of that. No. Uh, you know, other than an order giver, he didn't really do a well, lot of yeah, interaction. An order taker, you know, I mean, God, Well, okay, he yeah. just seemed like an errand boy to me. Yeah. You know, not very important. And uh, Yeah, there, there's actually another role from the temple that strikes me what's more that? bizarre. What's that? The people make covenants. And one of the covenants is that they, they consecrate themselves, their time, their talents, everything that God's blessed them with and everything that God may bless them with to the church, not to Jesus, but to the church. The building up of the... Okay, and so I, I, I used to take my wife up to the Idaho Falls Temple, and we'd consecrate everything we had to, to the church, and then we'd go straight over to the Outback, and I'd buy an $18 steak. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if everything's consecrated to the church, why doesn't the church get that? Why don't I just stop at Safeway and get an apple? <laughs> right? Uh, no one has lived that. But no here's, one can live the law like that. No, That's no right. one can live the law. But... But there's a part in the temple where Satan looks into the camera and he says, now I have a word concerning these people. Yeah. If you do not live up to every covenant you made at this altar, in this temple this day, you are in my power. Yeah. I used to always wonder about that as a Mormon because I knew that I was 100% Mormon about 90% of the time, which meant <laughs> I never fully lived the law. Right. Always wondering if you've done enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, my grandmother, uh, uh, just a few days before she passed away, I went to visit her, and she was terrified. And it, and I, I mean, she'd she been was a good Mormon all of her life. All of her life, yeah. a, a temple worker, dedicated. This woman's fried chicken alone should get her into heaven. <laughs> I mean, it's that good. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, but she was terrified. She said, I can't meet Jesus. What if I didn't do enough? What if I didn't do enough? What and, a burden. And that troubled me. Yeah. Because as a Mormon, I had the same problem because I was a 100% home teacher 90% of the time, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and it troubled me. But this Jesus now, my wife, she just gets up every day and she says, when's he coming? <laughs> I if can't was, wait to see him. If it was up to Mindy, he'd be here right now and he'd be staying in our spare room. That's how much she wants him to come. Yeah. And but we didn't have a concept of that as parents. No. So now you've you've experienced a bigger Jesus. Oh man. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. He is so big. And you know, I keep telling people if there were words and that's the problem is there is you and I we try to explain yeah. what we're feeling if there were words to make other people understand what we're feeling to really properly describe Jesus because we're trying to describe the indescribable yeah but if we could exp if we could describe him so that they could understand i believe every one of them would sell everything they own today to have what we have found well, I agree. I mean, it's just it's amazing how we how our perception of him has changed. And yeah. and the the word, the Bible shares such great stories like you're saying your wife's excited about going to church and it's because we're going to hear the message and, right. and hear about Jesus. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she just gets to go cry again. That's just her her thing, you her know. Thing. She gets to go cry again and she loves it. Well, I don't know if we've actually come to this moment, but this has only been about six or so months for you, right? I yeah. Mean, I know there's some process before that, but maybe you could share a little bit about what, what finally kind of brought you to, to things. I know you were always uncomfortable with polygamy, but that really wasn't your... Uh, no, I could, I could kind of push that yeah. aside. Yeah, I think yeah. most of us can kind of swallow that one a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, I had some problems, but, but the biggest one was... Uh, me being political as I am, yeah. running for legisl the legislature in Idaho and, and losing, by the way, <laughs> but uh, running and losing. Um, anyway, I, I always, I've always had a voice, you know, and I'm pretty much known by a lot of people across the state, and so I would voice things, and I, I believe that liberty and uh, faith, freedom and faith are like this, they're connected. Yeah. It's like our founders believed, right. you know. And so that's that's what I try to teach. And my bishop called me and he said, never again outside of church, not in podcasts or columns or can classes you, or yes. public speaking, can I speak of my faith? And that really tipped me over because I am not going to give up the, the freedom, one thing. Freedom of speech. <laughs> yeah, the the one thing that they fought for, and yeah. according to Mormons, they fought yeah. for in the preexistence was right. free agency. Right. And they were taking that away. And I, I wouldn't give it up, and so I chased that one all the way to the to the highest levels of the church leadership in Salt Lake, and yeah. they all they all supported uh, the destruction <laughs> of my First Amendment God given. And remember, the the Constitution doesn't give us the right; the Constitution only affirms that God gave us a right. Oh, that's one of those inalienable that's a, gifts. That's a good point. In the doctrine, of, or yeah. in, the, in the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And so they were taking away God-given rights. Mm. Again, standing in God's place, taking away, taking away what he had given, making yeah. him small. That's what religion does, doesn't it, does. it kind of, instead it of does. a relationship. It does. So now did you, uh, so as your wife and you shared finally that you both kind of had this feeling of, Things did you say? Well, maybe we should go to a, a Christian church, or what did you? What what happened? Well, we we, we bounced around for a short time, uh, tried some different churches, and I don't want to talk negatively about yeah. any, but some of them are still have a, lo a little bit of ritual and tradition. Yeah, and uh, well, we men, when men get involved, yeah, right? yeah, and they're good churches. I love yeah. them, but we we bounced around, and we finally found one gotcha. where. There's no ritual, there's no tradition, nobody's above anybody else, yeah. and it's except for Jesus, and yeah. he's above us all, yeah. but he's also with us all, in us all, loving us all, oh. and it's great, it's wonderful. Now, you feel like you've made changes in your life. You've become a new creature. Tell us a little bit about that <laughs> and what that means. You know, uh, one of the things that was so surprising to me was after I'd gone through all of this with my bishop and my stake president, yeah. right up to the, like I said, right up to the general authorities, authorities, I thought, 
man, I was so angry. I wanted to come down to Salt Lake and knock the temple down all by myself, you know. I was ticked off and I wanted, I wanted justice. And now, I don't feel anger to any of those people. That's awesome. I, I want to go, I, I want to go have an opportunity to talk with them and they won't let me. But I would just like to go tell them what has changed in my life and why it's so important to me. Hmm. But they... What would you say to them? Well... Jesus, I'm sure, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, Jesus, I'm sure. I'm sure that I would talk about a few things. One of the things that I love is the story of the day of Pentecost, where there, the prophecies of Joel, where we saw them actually come to pass, and the Spirit was poured out on all the people, anybody that wanted it. You know, I mean, even to the pagan Cornelius in his home, you know, the Romans. <laughs> That's right. You know, they were, they were given that spirit. I would tell them that because that is the, the new church, as, as you and I know, the, the church is the body of Christ. It's you and I and this guy back here who's yeah. doing whatever he does, yeah. his technician. We are the body of Christ. Yeah. We are the church. He's in us and we're in him. And the power of Christ is the Holy Spirit, which lives right here. And it is so active in my life that it, it pours out of my heart, it bubbles out of my mouth. I can't stop it. And, man, who needs anything else? Yeah. We've kind of hinted at it, but what, what did you understand about grace before this all happened? I, my only hope was that if I could continue to be a 100% home teacher 90% of the time, that, that, that maybe enough. God would cover the difference. <laughs> well, that's it, <laughs> that's isn't it? That's it, yeah. Now what do you understand about grace? I understand, as is taught again and again and again in the Bible, yeah. that if I love and believe in Jesus, and I can't just say the words. I think that my, I, have to, I have to live Put as a disciple. Action. Yeah, I have to love, love as a disciple. Love God and your fellow man. But if yeah. I do, it's enough. Someone asked on one of our podcasts one day, well, which, which sins can a Christian commit and be forgiven of? And my son-in-law, who's an amazing guy, he's a, he's been, he was never a Mormon, he, he piped in, he said, all of them! And that's the beauty of it. It's, it's not that we believe we can go out and have all this ruckus, sinful living. Or that we are inclined to do that, right? Well, right, we're yeah. not. Right. But the fact of the matter is, we are never beyond God's reach. He's paid if for we the turn sins. To him, if we turn to Him. Yeah. Yeah. That is so beautiful to me. And that's grace. That's and grace. I never understood that as, as a Latter-day Saint. And like your, was it your mother or your grandmother, I guess, that was worried about where yeah, she was my headed? Grandmother. Yeah, grandmother. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Yeah. To carry that burden and not, not have that freedom of, uh, of knowing that, that Jesus has paid for the sins. And, and as long as you love him and love your fellow man, you're... Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because my wife, I keep talking about her. She's a little shy, so that's why she's not here today. But, <laughs> we'll have to grab but, her sometime. But her, her middle name is Grace, and she mentioned the oh, other day that, that yeah. maybe, maybe I ought to start calling her by her middle name because she's so excited about what she's found. Well, I'm so thrilled that that she that you've been able to do this together. There's so oh, many yeah. sad stories of men or women that have found Jesus, and and once you find him, there's no putting him back in the bottle, is there? Oh no. Yeah, I mean you, you can't. <laughs> I know. I mean you know, you, it's impossible, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So so to have you two together on this, you know, and I know some families have been disrupted because of. Yeah of what one of the, one of the others found out but yeah. uh, well well there has been it's pain. undeniable yeah there has been pain with but kid, she and with kids or not so much with our kids with, with brothers and with ex more extended family but yeah. there has yeah. there's been pain but between her and I we are so much happier now than we had ever than we ever could have imagined we could be does it's she think amazing. you're a nicer guy now you think we were walking you were probably always i you know we've guy. always been madly in love yeah. but we were walking through the store a grocery store a while ago and I said you know honey I think I love you more and I and I knew, instantly knew that was wrong see I've loved her with my whole heart my yeah. whole life and I said no that's wrong that's wrong I'm I'm loving you better and she just smiled and nodded yeah everything is better everything about our life is brighter and wholer and richer and fuller it's just amazing I don't think people can really appreciate and understand what we're trying to what we're saying actually you know, they, unless they've experienced it or are willing to step back and kind of accept Jesus as as their Lord and and Master. 
they, they each have to choose him individually. Yeah. And it, as much as we'd like to do it for them, yeah. I don't think we can. Yeah. Well, let's see. There's a couple of other things. One thing that you mentioned in one of something I read, I guess, was knowing more about some of the Book of Mormon characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my wife and I, we read the Bible and we go, oh, put that in there. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and we just realized that we knew more about Alma and Nephi and Joseph Smith than we ever knew yeah. about Jesus. And that's a tragedy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And And when... I mean, we just were never asked to read the Bible as a Mormon. It's always, let's read the Book of Mormon or have a Book of Mormon night or something mm, where people, yeah. the young kids would go out and read yeah. read the Book of Mormon for hours and on end and stuff. And yeah. You ever sit with your wife and just say, can you imagine, can you believe what just happened to us or what's happened to All you? the time. Do you really? All the time. We it's, do that too. It's like, wow, <laughs> you know, because we just, we, we had no concept that this was even possible. And yeah, it is. And, and I guess you've shared it, but what is it that really kind of tipped you over? Did I miss that, or did I mean what? Uh, oh, oh, finally uh, said, okay, my, I've, I, 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 this can't be right, and this has to be right. Yeah, my my wife and I, when we finally decided that we maybe need to look elsewhere, we just decided to put everything literally on the okay. altar. Okay, all right. And we talked I about that in the last that, session. Yeah, and we went to Jesus and said. We will give it all up, everything. Now, now, did you know all of the bad news of Mormonism? None of it. We you didn't know about the first visions and the archaeology of the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham and masonry in the temple? And I didn't know a little bit about that. I'd heard that. But see, as a Mormon, I'd refuse to look at that. Because so, it, it was anti. Yeah, yeah. And so before That's we... That's amazing. So you what, came to Christ. We came to Christ, and then with Christ... Then you knew this couldn't be right. Yeah, and so we I never looked at anything about Joseph Smith or polygamy or blood atonements or all of the nonsense and craziness until Jesus was walking with us. And so for us, I think that made it easier because wow, we had him. that's amazing. And that's that's what I would encourage people to do is don't go out and disprove Mormonism. Go prove Jesus. And then That's such a good message. Because and you probably experience this too in some of your relationships uh, where people actually leave the church and then they completely leave religion. Or yeah. leave Jesus, I don't mean religion, but they leave Jesus or, yeah. or leave God completely and become atheist or mm -hmm. or agnostic or something. And Yeah, and that's a tragedy per, too. Per, per, prayerfully, God will find them eventually, but uh, yeah. I know it's a challenge for some of them. Mm -hmm. and kids, how are they doing with you? Uh, some are thrilled. Some are, are they? Yeah, so I, we have we have three that are just ecstatic for us, and can't believe that mom and dad have done this. Uh, well, they were all shocked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have two that are struggling a little bit, but they're accepting, yeah. and we have a good relationship with yeah. them. And and God willing, you know, we at at this point we recognize that it's in Jesus's hands. Are you finding any way to talk to them at all? A, a little bit. Is that, uh, a, it's a awkward, bit. isn't it? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Because you don't want to, it's like every time you see them, you want to <laughs> give them a message, yeah. right? Just a little <laughs> Jesus injection there. A but, kick in the rear or something. Yeah, it's, it's challenging, but, uh, but our relationships are good. Yeah. And I know we have, there's just too many scriptures that say, do what you can do and then leave it to me. And yeah. that's what we're going to do. Trust in God. And exactly right. Just trusting that, and that's kind of my prayer too, is that, um, always that, that Jesus answers prayers perfectly. Mm -hmm. And if he's answering them this way now, that must be perfect. Right. You know, and just trust in that. So, right. Well, gosh. Uh, Word dot one. Is that where we want to go? Yeah, let's do that. Oh, in fact, you, yeah, you want to talk about comparative. Uh, yeah, just, just Tell just us real about quick. that for sure. Um, at, at Word dot one, and that's the word dot O N E. So there's no dot com. It's www.theword.one. Uh -huh. Jump on over there. We're starting a new thing called comparative studies. And we're starting with the New Testament. We're using the Gospel Doctrine Instructor's Manual. From the church. From the Mormon church. Okay. And we will just quote some things right out of that manual. We won't make comments about it. It's not my job. It's your job to figure out what things mean. But we will quote those and then we will go directly to the Bible and we'll talk about what the Bible says about those same verses and chapters that are being studied. And what you will see, I think, 
is that the contrast between the two is so stark, you will be shocked and you will, just like my wife and I do, just like Earl and his <laughs> wife do, you'll say, who put that in the Bible? <laughs> it's right. amazing. It's so great. So come on over to that site, register, and uh, then we can send you updates as, we, as those come out. And you can, you, then you are free to see for yourself what the Mormon religion is putting out there in the manual and see what the Bible says. And you decide what's true. It's up to you. It's for them to decide what's true. Do you take any time preparing people to understand that the Bible is trustworthy, reliable? I mean, that's one of the problems in, you know, the eighth article of faith kind of gives everybody a, a little consternation you know, about the reliability <laughs> of the Bible. You know, that's, I, I don't know how to counter that. But I, but I would say this. When I was a kid, they were talking about the Journal of Discourses, and now they're disavowing that. So the Journal of Discourses is the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly. <laughs> and now they've done the same thing with the history of the church. It's the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly. With the doctrines of salvation, they're doing the same thing. Pretty soon... Mormon doctrine, Bruce R. McConkie's book is the I, same I, I, yeah. I, Okay. Yeah. But the thing, the, my point is, pretty soon the only book that will be of any value at all is the Book of Mormon because everything, even their own former doctrines in these... Have changed. Have changed. Yeah. And so... You have the Bible. It's the Word of God. If you go to Jesus and you're willing to lay down everything you think you know and believe Him, I guarantee you that you won't worry about whether the Bible is true or not anymore. Because I can't convince you it's true. Jesus can. Jesus will. Yeah, and he, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. <laughs> Jesus was effective, and He didn't need to be restored or... Uh, redone. Well, is, it, yeah, isn't that amazing that because if you believe that it all went away, you have to believe that God wasn't powerful enough to preserve His to, own word. To keep His own word. Oh, well, that would be the little Jesus that can't keep that word straight. That's right. But the big Jesus did. Yeah. And He kept it all In the beginning writing. was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word is amazing. Yeah. Lance, thanks so much for coming down, and I Thank appreciate you. it so much. You're a, it's been fun. You're a delight, and, and you're a arms instructor and constitutional instructor and so I hope everybody will go to the the word dot one and and check you out and learn more about you and and some of these things that you've written and again Millie's written and so on are just fabulous uh, oh, insights you. into the cross and uh, many many other topics so join us again good night mm -hmm.